Welcome to Inbox. I'm Sophie. And I am Jessica. These are our stories for today. An art that has been dead for over 800 years is being brought back to life when Jim Austin of Oakland picks up the hammer. And following that, we visit the world of fashion where we get to see how technology is changing the way we shop. And finally, we will take a look at how libraries are adapting to all the changes over the last decade. They are trying to update their resources and stay attractive to their visitors. All of that and more after the break. Stay tuned. Nomads, conquerors, seafarers. For nearly 300 years they explored, raided, and traded in such places as Asia, Europe, and the North Atlantic. The Vikings may longer rule Norway, but they are not extinct. My great-grandparents are from Sweden and Norway, and there is a tie-in there. I like doing something that's a little off the beaten trail. The Viking you now see is James Robert Austin, Jim for short. Hard to believe this Seattle native would be considered a Viking. I guess because he does not have the typical fur clothing and helmet with horns. But he is one exceptional blacksmith and ax maker. For the last couple of years, I've been interested primarily in Viking Age axes. It also turns out that axes have an intense amount of blacksmithing for their size. They're very sculptural in, in essence, and I just like all of the form changing that goes on in an axe. Uh, Norwegian axes are very well uh, known for having these pronounced sharp top and bottom lobes that they call langets. Uh, the axes got a, just a beautiful form often, just with all of these tapers and transitions. A steel collisionist, clanging and banging. Anvils, hammers, tongs, and power tools. Jim uses them all. But what is his preference? I would prefer to spend as much of my time as I could doing very primitive techniques, uh, even down to making my own iron. I'd like to be able to provide a certain number of axes in the original material used by Vikings three decades ago. That's when Jim started his apprenticeship in Germany, making everything from gates to candle holders. This is a very special anvil. It's called the South German pattern. It was made by hand in the factory called Soding and Halbach in 1903. I brought it with me from uh, my apprentice time in Germany. This would be like my typical hand hammer. This would be the the most basic tools, of course, you're going to be using tongs with that, but those are in back here. This is a gas furnace. This is what you use to heat up your steel. Uh, earlier, they would have used charcoal and coal. You just pipe in gas and air, light them inside, and you get or just this rolling, intense flame of, uh, of gas that will basically bring your metal up nearly to the melting point. We're talking about metal that's yellow hot. 2200 degrees. Long hair and a hammer, I dare Thor to challenge me. I got the hand hammer technique. <laughs> now let me work the big machine. This is called an air hammer. This was probably designed ar around the year 1900, 1905. I believe that the firm was Bechet in Germany. Uh, this was manufactured in the U.S. probably in the 1920s or the 1930s. And it simply pounds down onto your steel uh, so that you can do a lot of steps in your metal forming much more quickly. Tough economic times have not discouraged Jim from making axes. For about $500, you can own an authentic Viking axe. There's a demand for authenticity in things mm -hmm. and things that are connected to the past. People are more interested now, I think, than they were 30 years ago in how their ancestors made things. And everybody has a certain fascination for things made in old ways. The fact that you can even do it is interesting to people. 
And anybody who's followed up and, and brought these techniques back, it's interesting for people to, to watch them uh, do what they do. And to have something, maybe to buy something that they can take home to represent what they saw. Throat. With friend Anna Geyer's Master Metal Molder Jim is selling instructional axe making DVDs. He sells them all the time. There's blacksmiths out there who want to know how things are made. He's a master and others aren't. He's an excellent source of knowledge. Blacksmiths tend to share their knowledge with each other and that's one way to do it. The precision craftsman has now become the professor with chalkboard furnace, tong ruler, hammer pin, Anvil projector. If knowledge is power, then Odin needs to watch his throne. I do teaching at the shop. I also travel to do teaching. Right now, it's, a, it's about axes because it's a, a topic that a lot of people are interested in. Mm. And this technique that I've kind of researched is not very well known. And I see my role eventually as being more in education than producing objects for sale. Wednesday nights are for weapons and welding. The shop is open to those who want to matriculate in metal manipulation. His YouTube video has almost half a million views, more than enough to keep him from axing his axe making. Crafting mines in metal, Jim wants to craft a voyage, an exploration, destination Norway, the Viking home. Jim Austin. Blacksmith, axe maker, teacher, American, Viking. Well, I'd never think I'd see John as a blacksmith. Well, I don't know if I would have done a much better job myself, so do you think I have the guns for it? Yeah, definitely. Maybe. <laughs> Coming up next, how is the fashion industry changing as a result of technology? We will find out right after the break. See you soon. Fashion Tech is looking to make it easier to shop, make fashion more entertaining, and make the buying process more effective. Doris Lynn of Look Maisie invited us to her event at Macy's Union Square to get an inside look of her social shopping site. What's the first process of, of this process? So it's really easy. So we're basically going to sign you up for an account with us. Okay. And that basically starts your profile. So cool. it's really simple. I just need you to sign in. And what's the difference between signing up on Facebook and signing up with your email? Is there? No, that's a great question. So when you sign up through Facebook, we basically connect you so that any of your activity, if you want, gets shared with your friends. So okay. if you add something to your wish list or put something in your closet, we let your friends know. So usually people are curious oh, cool. to see what okay. their friends are doing. So, so it's connected. Oh, so perfect. So once you're connected, um, you can select your username. Okay. We default one for you. And now we allow you to select five of your favorite stores and oh, cool. the reason why we do this is that we want to customize your experience on Look Amazing. Also awesome. the stores you select basically allows us Macy's of course <laughs> allows us to personalize it better. So okay. perfect. So there you go. You're all signed up and right. you basically can move on to our second part of it which is getting styled. Alright. So, Alright, that's your be fun. <laughs> I headed over to Macy's and Look Amazing's closet and I was met by Alex of SF Shop Girl. She put together some of Macy's spring essentials to incorporate in her looks. My favorite, a Rachel Roy burnt orange jumpsuit paired with a BCBG black and white print jacket. Well, this would go wonderfully together. And awesome. they would really look great on you as well. Okay, awesome, thanks. I guess the next step is just go try this stuff on. All right, All right. let's go. All right, it's the moment of truth. I'm going to try on my outfit that was styled by Alex of SF Shop Girl, but you can't come in the fitting room with me. All right, the big reveal. Now it's time to go get my photo taken at Look Amazing's photo booth.
After my attempt at modeling, it was time to upload my photo with Yvonne. Oh God, okay, there I am. Lookmazing is a platform where you can shop, style, and share. You upload photos, tag your clothes, and can share across multiple social platforms, allowing your friends to shop your looks. With over 150 affiliates like Macy's, Look Amazing eliminates the need to search various websites to shop. And then the cool thing is when you click on it, someone can purchase it. But is the tagging process too much work? We sat down with Lorraine Sanders of Digital Style Digest to explore further. So that you see a lot of things that are like a really great idea and there's all these cool bells and whistles and the features are really interesting, but like who has the time? We are definitely online shoppers just because we yeah. <laughs> do work full time and run the blog on the side. So online shopping is definitely key. A lot of fashion bloggers are kind of the pioneers in trying to figure out how to monetize content. And we run the fashion blog, BritainWit.com. Mm -hmm. Our fashion blog is kind of a compilation of our daily style, what we wear to work, what we wear on the weekend. Mm -hmm. We try to make it really fun and approachable. They figured out single-handedly how to market themselves, create a story, um, build an audience, um, deal with all the technology, you know, the tech stuff that goes into running a blog. And being that we are based in San Francisco, exactly. it's kind of a perfect mixes of two worlds because we have Silicon Valley, Google, Facebook, Yahoo all here. So, and you really have to understand mm -hmm. the web to be able to have a fashion blog. I mean, it's pretty pivotal. Yeah. <laughs> I actually don't think that they're often given enough credit. We've already seen it start to take off. You know, there mm -hmm. was Twitter, which helped to you know promote posts, and then it went to Instagram, and everything was more visual. And now we have Vine, yep. where everything yeah. is like short videos. So it's just like as the technology progresses, it just gives people a chance to get. Um, that much more immersed with their, you know, your looks and fashion and yep. being able to see behind the scenes um, takes. It's all about mobile. Mobile platforms are hot right now and with the use of location-based features on smartphones, there's opportunity to make the purchasing process more efficient. Startups are giving us exactly what we want when we want it at the point of purchase. The cherry on top? Rewards. A really good example of it is a company called Shopkick. They're based in the South Bay, and they give you rewards for shopping. When you walk into um, one of their partner retailers with your phone, the phone, uh, your, the app like recognizes that you're there, and you get rewards just for physically being in the store that you can then use to buy things um, later. It makes retailers really happy because they're bringing, there's an incentive for people to come into the store whether or not they buy. Um, and it makes shoppers happy because they get free stuff just for doing things they would otherwise, you know, be doing in their day to day. Being downtown, my phone is lighting up with different Shopkick notifications. I get 35 just for walking into Macy's. I'm going to take this opportunity to check out that Rachel Roy jumpsuit I've had my eye on ever since Alex from SF Shop Girl recommended it. Maybe I'll have enough kicks. So it'll be really cool to see um, how we're shopping differently and buying differently, you know, a decade from now because of this um, trend. Jessica, what are you doing? I'm buying a new blazer. Now? Purchase. I guess so. This app is amazing. Well, I agree. And our next story also involves technology and changes in our routines. That's right, Sophie. Noelle takes us to a couple of libraries to see how they have changed over the years. Stick around for more right after the break. Rows of books, gathering dust over the ages, stacked on shelves in a quiet library. Old, overstuffed chairs where visitors used to sit and enjoy a page turner. Traditionally, this is how we envision libraries, but that is changing. Today, libraries are no longer what they used to be. The humming from computers, the tapping on keys, all is part of a changing digital age. In San Mateo, California, embracing high tech has created high demands. The only time this library is empty 
Good morning, guys. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. All right, you too. Is before it opens. Let's go upstairs. Okay. Head librarian Ben Ocon took us on a tour. The library is fulfilling different roles, and sometimes it's actually fulfilling an economic incubation of innovation and of ideas through the resources and how people are using the library. During the reconstruction, the library incorporated many ideas from its visitors. Their impact can be seen everywhere. The community really wanted a welcoming environment. They wanted to break stereotypes of, uh, of a library. We do have some quiet rooms in which those that expect a little bit more quiet when they come to the library, they can use those. And this library is anything but quiet. It has become a social meeting spot for small businesses and customers, from kids to seniors. Well, here is the business center. The Business Resource Center provides information on companies and in various industries and offers classes and workshops for small businesses to help them thrive. Ray Huter is an entrepreneur who took advantage of the Business Center, which helped him get his own company started. They found it easier to talk about business in this surrounding than they would say going to, say, Starbucks. Huter also found other library resources useful for his business, such as conference rooms, computers, and around the corner, was that a cafe that I spotted? Yes. Uh -huh. And coffee. They can get a cup of coffee while they're browsing through a newspaper or magazine. We allow uh, beverages and food to be consumed in the library. Everywhere in the library. Yes, right. Uh -huh. The visitors are not alone in enjoying the new resources. Behind the scenes, the staff is using radio frequency identification technology to automatically sort the returned books with this machine. Technology is very important here at the San Mateo Library. It's a different type of library these days, and so we've been working with new service models that uh, have been very popular. Other libraries have also been reinventing themselves to better serve the community. This library has over 500,000 titles, but you won't find them stacked on shelves. It may look like the average library, but this Southern California branch has also become a publisher through their espresso book machine. For around $10, you can print any type of book, chosen from a database with over 500,000 titles. Author Jack Delgado wanted to get his own book printed through the espresso book machine. It's cheap, it's fast, and you get to see copies of your own book, which is a great ego booster. The trend is that, that paper publishing is dying, but for now, you can still print a book and people still like, you know, the feel of paper in their hands and everything. It's a bit more tangible than an e-book. There will always be people who want, um, who want books, who love books. I'm one of those people. It's not a surprise that self-publishing authors are taking advantage of the services offered in Temecula. I think that's cool. Um, I honestly never thought that anyone would do that, but I can see why people would want it and why they would supply something like that. The process is simple. Print the book on paper, align the pages, glue them to the cover, trim the edges, and there's the finished product. In less time than it takes to finish a cup of espresso. Technology has in fact become useful for libraries to stay alive. Today they can print the books themselves. This is a short book, so in addition, they are offering ebooks and are renting out ebook readers. The Independent Library in San Anselmo, California, focuses on serving the small town and has only a small selection of books to offer. Printed, that is. Besides offering physical books and selected ebooks on their nooks, they also have a library in the cloud where visitors can download ebooks to their own devices. But while visitors are checking out the new technology, if they want a book in San Anselmo, it is still done the old-fashioned way. I don't know about you, but I think there is something about doing things the old way once in a while. I agree, although technology saves us a lot of time. True. And that was all for this episode of Inbox. We hope you enjoyed it. See you next time. For today's Almanac, Viking classes are held every Wednesday from 7 to 9 p.m. at 2440 Adeline Street in Oakland. Cash in your kick points for a free latte at Starbucks, a gift card at many stores, even designer merchandise and trips. 
Download Shopkicks available on Android and iPhone markets. Libraries are still educating the public now with modern technology. Visit your nearest library to witness the advances.